some closing remarks from, from Washington Conservation Action CEO, Alyssa Macy. Uh, since the commissioner's remarks are via a pre-recorded video, there won't be any capacity for a question and answer afterwards. Uh, so allow me to provide a few reminders before we play the commissioner's remarks. Uh, our third and final day of the conference will be next Wednesday, November 15th, again from 1 to 5 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, we will move the conversation from the forest level to the downstream products, buildings, and supply chains. We'll explore how we can create more supply chains for sustainable wood products that meet growing market demand for climate smart build materials. The session is absolutely packed with great presenters and we'll be diving right in, so don't be late. Um, and, and if you're feeling bummed that we're already more than halfway through this year's conference, remember we also have an in-person happy hour event uh, to continue the conversation. Uh, the happy hour uh, will be Thursday, November 16th, so a week from tomorrow, from 4 to 7 p.m. in Two Beers Brewing Company's The Woods Tasting Room, which is located in Seattle's Industrial District. Uh, we really do love the, the virtual format. Uh, that allows us to bring in so many people from across the Pacific Northwest uh, and beyond. But we also miss seeing you all in person. So if you're in the Seattle area or you just need an excuse to get into the Seattle area, uh, make sure you've got that evening on the 16th uh, booked on your calendars. There's uh, more details about the happy hour on the conference webpage. Uh, and then please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. So. With those announcements out of the way, let's move to our final presentation. Historically, we've offered the Commissioner of Public Land space in the conference to share their perspective on carbon and forestry. This year, Commissioner Franz sent a pre-recorded message. The views expressed are those of the Commissioner and not necessarily the views of Washington Conservation Action or any partners who are presenting at this year's Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference. Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary Franz, was elected in 2016. She leads the Department of Natural Resources, managing nearly 6 million acres of public lands, from coastal waters and aquatic reserves to working forests and farms. Commissioner Franz is a third generation farmer and small forest landowner, and we will play her recorded marks for you now. At the Department of Natural Resources, we take very seriously the issue of climate change. We have to. We're on the front lines of climate change every single day. From the catastrophic wildfires our firefighters fought courageously on the ground and in the air in Alberta, Maui, Alaska, Oregon, and our own state. To the billions of acres of federal, state, and private forest lands, our foresters work on both sides of the state trying to reduce the increasing disease, drought, and insect infestations. Or the landslides our geologists respond to with increased storm events. Or ocean acidification harming our kelp and eelgrass beds that our aquatic managers and marine biologists are working tirelessly to restore and to recover. The impact of drought on the 1 million acres of agricultural lands we manage, or the urban forestry work, we have grown to meet the goal of tree equity in every single neighborhood of our state to reduce the increasing heat that summer after summer is impacting our most vulnerable communities. Through our experience and expertise on the land, the water, and in the air, we see and feel the year-to-year -year changes probably better than any other agency and the more than most people do. Our research scientists, foresters, firefighters, biologists, ecologists, geologists, divers, land managers, and more are also parents and grandparents. So we take very seriously our work and doing our best to try to care for the health of these lands and waters our children and our grandchildren will inherit. I'm here today to clear up the record, the false narrative and honor the work we at the Department of Natural Resources have accomplished in implementing a comprehensive strategy to protect our forests in the face of climate change and reduce the impacts of climate change through our forests. Our work is more than just storing carbon in forest ecosystems. It's built upon four main objectives. One, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Two, preventing forest conversion 
Three, adapting and building forest resilience to climate change. And four, sequestering more carbon through forest management. In our approach, we're deploying climate smart forestry practices that considers the entire value chain from forests to wood products. In this way, our climate smart forestry practices aim at climate change mitigation, but try to achieve synergies with other forest functions, such as adaption to climate change, biodiversity conservation, protection of culture resources and honoring indigenous rights, ecosystem services, and the bioeconomy. Now, the threat to our forest from wildfire is releasing more carbon than ever before. This year, over 46 million acres of forest burned in Canada, releasing around 410 megatons of carbon. To put this in perspective, annually, the world loses 17.3 million acres to deforestation. So Canada's fires alone account for more than double that typical loss. I have refused to stand by and allow wildfire to consume our forests. Since 2017, we have dramatically transformed the, we, the way we fight wildfires, requiring initial attack the moment smoke is in the air, increasing our air resources to 840, investing in local state firefighting resources on the ground, and preventing millions of acres of forest going up in flames and their carbon being released. Indeed, this year, there were roughly as many fires that started this year as occurred in 2015, yet more than a million acres burned in 2015, while only about 165,000 acres burned this year. We were able to keep 95% of our fires below 10 acres, well below our, or excuse me, well above our goal of 90% below 10 acres. That's a lot of forests protected and an enormous amount of carbon saved. We are also investing in making our forests more resilient to a changing climate. With millions of acres of forest land dying, facing disease, insect infestation, and drought, not just on the eastern part of our state, but also in the west, there is growing risk of more carbon being released into the atmosphere. Management actions are critical in avoiding or mitigating the impacts of disturbances. Forest treatments, thinning, creating space and gaps, and prescribed fire have been effective at ameliorating drought and disease impacts and have shown the potential to reduce the occurrence of high severity fires. To date, we have restored over 500,000 acres of federal, state, tribal, and private forest lands in just six years. We are well on our way to restoring over 1 million acres of forest in 10 years, well ahead of our 20 year goal. Six years ago, we had one person to do forest health work. And today we now have one of the largest federal forest health programs in the nation. As well, we are rapidly expanding investments in our forest health on state and small private forest landowners. Our forest health work is reducing our catastrophic wildfires and thus reducing our carbon emissions from these fires, while also enabling our forests to sequester more carbon. These forests sequester more carbon by preventing these forests from dying due to disease, insect infestation, and drought, and by turning the smaller diameter trees and disease trees into building product from two by fours to cross laminated timber. We're now focused on our west side forest as we see increasing dying off of our west side forest. And for the first time, more than half of our wildfires were west of the Cascades. We are also losing our forest to conversion from single family residential development to the wildland urban interface to subdivisions and shopping malls. Washington state is the evergreen state, but for the first time, less than 50% of our state is forested. We have already lost 1 million acres of forest in the last 20 years, and we're slated to lose another million in the next 20 years. We're seeing more people moving into our forest to build homes and development. This deforestation is bad for our environment and it is bad for climate change, reducing our ability to achieve our carbon reduction goals. It also reduces much needed fish and wildlife habitat, reduces our ability to capture and store much needed water, and puts more people at risk for wildfires. I do not believe this is the future we want. So under my Keep Washington Evergreen initiative, we have taken a stand to conserve 1 million acres of forest 
preventing the deforestation of our vital forests. We've been accelerating our conservation of forest lands, preventing their conversion, and keeping these forests working for our environment, a strong, sustainable economy, and our communities. In the last six years, we have conserved over 25,000 acres of working forest land and preserved over 49,000 acres of high ecologically valuable forest land. We've also created four new natural areas and expanded 11 existing natural areas for a total of 11,300 acres. And our work is not done. Thanks to many of you, the state passed the Landmark Climate Commitment Act. And through the Climate Commitment Act, we work to include natural resource solutions to sequestering carbon. And this year, we will conserve at least another 13,000 acres of forest land. And we're positioning Washington State to secure significant investments at the federal level from the Forest Legacy Program. Lastly, we employ some of the most sustainable adaptive forest management to protect and enhance the potential forest to adapt to and mitigate climate and deliver more ecosystem benefits. Climate smart forestry requires a long term view of forest management and an appreciation of economic, social and ecological benefits forests offer to communities. At DNR, we do both. We are managing our forests to improve forest growth, carbon sequestration, climate adaption, including focusing timber production on a smaller land base. The aim is to sustain ecosystem integrity and function and to ensure the continuous delivery of ecosystem services while minimizing the impact of climate induced changes to our forest. We have set aside approximately 1 million acres for pure conservation of ecological services, safeguarding our highest conservation value forests. That is half of our entire forest land portfolio. We are employing adaption measures to our forests that maintain or improve their ability to grow under current and projected climate conditions, increase their resistance and resilience. We're promoting genetic compositional structural and functional diversity at both the stand and the landscape scale. Our work includes facilitating natural regeneration and also planting tree species, genetic variants that are adapted to the future climate conditions. We have some of the largest ecological buffers on fish and wildlife habitat areas and water bodies, larger than legally required to ensure water quality and protection of critical fish and wildlife, and larger than any other landowner and land use in Washington. Through our federal habitat conservation plan, our old growth policy and our sustainable forest policy, we protect our high ecologically valuable forests, and we're protecting and restoring hundreds of thousands of acres of habitat for over 90 imperiled threatened and endangered species. We grow our forests on longer rotations across all trusts. The average day of a harvest since 2006 is 80 years. Let me say that again. The average age of harvest since 2006 is 80 years across all trusts. When you remove silviculture, thinning, forest health, more than 70% of our forests are grown to well over 60 year rotation. DNR manages all of our Western Washington forest lands the same as we do on our FSC enrolled lands. There is no difference in our management between those that are FSC enrolled and those that are not. And all of our forests are SFI certified. And lastly, we respect and uphold the rights and sovereignty of tribal nations and indigenous people through early and ongoing consultation and co-stewardship of cultural and natural resources on our 2 million acres of forest land. It is for these reasons, the preeminent forestry scientist, Dr. Jerry Franklin said, in this state, the most innovative large forest management organization is the Department of Natural Resources. And while people may not be completely happy with what they're doing, it's so profoundly changed from what it was doing 30 years ago as to defy belief. So when it comes to climate smart forestry, we're not standing on the sidelines or even waiting for you all to agree on a definition and criteria for climate smart forestry. Instead, we're leading the way. We are showing the world what sustainable ecological climate smart forestry truly looks like in practice. 
Why? Because as I said in the very beginning, we every day see and feel the impacts of climate change that it is having on our forests, and we do not have the luxury of waiting. Now, by no means does this mean that DNR is resting, saying that is good enough. No, we are leaning in even hard in our forest resilience, conservation, restoration, and reforestation. I came here today to set the record straight, to stand up for the 2,000 men and women at DNR who put their heart and their hard work on the line every day to protect our lands, waters, and communities. I came here today to also urge everyone to end the division, the divisiveness, and come together to address the crisis in front of us. The continued loss of our force, especially now on the west side, to disease, drought, and development, and climate change. More than ever, we need to build a broad-based coalition ready for bold action to persuade people of the importance of protecting our forests from these threats. And to change the minds, we have to do a lot more listening and working with all those working in the forestry sector, from academia, large and small landowners, research institutions, milling and wood manufacturing industry, as well as the design and build. We can't just yell at them or say they're ignorant. We can't just tweet at them. We must understand their realities and their role and work with them. Righteousness destroys community by insisting that our personal rightness is more valuable than someone else's humanity. We don't have to look back very far to remember what this looks like and the impact that it has had on real lives and that it continues to have on people who weren't even born at the time. A few years ago, I met with a man in his late 40s who grew up in Port Angeles, Washington. He said the most significant moment of his childhood was the year the spotted owl decision came down, when it was decided that millions of acres of old growth forest must be preserved if the spotted owl was to survive. This decision was so important for our forests, our wildlife habitat, and our climate. But we didn't stick the landing. We didn't think about a just transition for the timber communities that were impacted. Indeed, we turned our back on these communities. Thousands of jobs lost overnight. And as the months and years and decades passed, people saw their futures dim. Parents struggled. Children struggled. Often going without meals. Families were torn apart. Increased abuse at home with parents and then even teens numbing their pain with addiction. And the impacts of that decision and the way we turned our back on those communities play out still to this day, where generational poverty ripples through the fabric of these communities. It didn't have to be this way, but we can learn. We can repair the damage that we caused, so we have a choice to make. I believe united, we can engineer a solution to heal our planet that also heals our people and our communities. I believe our public lands will be and must be at the heart of that effort. Because ultimately, none of our technologies and a lesson will matter if we are not healing our people with humanity, compassion, and justice. Right now, our urban and rural areas have become more divided, and we have become more comfortable with this divide. Righteousness, fear, anger, all have combined to make us believe that our problems are not our fault, that these problems are not our problems. The future of humanity depends on finding a harmony between place and people, where we heal our, our landscapes along with the minds, bodies, and hearts of the people living here. Because I believe our survival will not ultimately be determined or our innovation. Our survival will be determined by how we treat each other because we need each other. As Brian Stevenson tells us, ultimately our humanity depends on everyone's humanity. And through that humanity we share with each other, we will ensure our public lands are working for everyone. We will ensure that we are taking care of our lands, waters, and the people who live here today and in the future. 
I thank you for your time today, and I look forward to coming together for our forests, our lands, our waters, and our communities. Thank you. All right, that is the end of today's presentations. And so with that, I will hand it over to our CEO at Washington Conservation Action, Alyssa Macy, to deliver some final thoughts for the day. Alyssa, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Brian. Since our founding in the 1960s, Washington Conservation Action has brought people together who care deeply about our communities and our environment to fight fiercely for a brighter future for the next generations. We orient our work towards clean air and water, healthy forests, a thriving democracy, and a deep commitment to building relationships that move mountains, bring us joy, and create a space to work together to solve our state's most complex environmental challenges. Washington Conservation Action is committed to fostering authentic relationships in order to protect people and nature as one. We respect public leaders like the Commissioner of Public Lands in voicing their thoughts about management of natural resources. Diverse opinions and views help foster rich discussions. We know these are meaningful for the future of our forests and our environment. The Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference is a perfect place for this, where we all come together to learn, to exchange innovative ideas, and to be inspired. Together, we generate collective energy that sustains our connections and powers the work ahead. Thank you so much, Alishla, for taking the time to share those thoughtful remarks. That is all we have for you today. Uh, thank you so much for attending the conference uh, and being part of our conversation. Uh, it has been another awesome uh, day of presentations. I hope you all have a great rest of your week and look forward to seeing you back here next Wednesday for day three, Climate Smart Wood and Supply Chains.